Sam Hodder, Save the Redwoods League. Save the Redwoods League was founded in 1918, 96 years ago, and it was just when the conservation community in America was at its earliest stages. And even then, uh, right after the turn of the century, much of the conservation work that was happening and the philosophy of the League's founders had been impacted by Olmsted Sr. Um, the work that he did first at Central Park and then with as being the head of the first commission that established uh, Yosemite around the beautiful giant sequoia of the Mariposa Grove, that philosophy that was shared by uh, Olmsted Jr. of parks as the, as the grand reflection of our democracy uh, was something that was core to the philosophy of, of the early conservationists that founded Save the Redwoods League. And indeed, within a few years of our founding in 1918, our first leader, Newton Drury, uh, hired Olmsted, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., uh, to help advise on park issues. And that relationship uh, was, um, w was so sustaining to the work of the League that actually Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. stayed on as uh, on our board of counselors for 29 years. So his philosophy wasn't just something that the Save the Redwood League pursued and ingrained into their mission. He was actually at the table helping us to craft our mission and how it was implemented. And the work of saving the Redwoods uh, was a central component to the creation of the California State Park System, with, which was his other job. Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. developed the California State Park Survey in 1927. Um, it was at our urging, the League's urging, that he was hired to do that job. And because of his passion for the Redwoods, uh, the Redwoods of Northern California in particular, their unique, iconic beauty, their representation of, uh, of the American landscape, had uh, had at their core, or had redwoods then at the core of the California State Park system from its earliest days. So um, uh, ever since we've we've kept that Olmstedian vision and philosophy of uh, of protecting special places, but of equal importance, connecting people to those places, as core to how we see redwood conservation and our mission of saving the redwoods. Historically, the work of the League uh, in both helping to create the California State Park System and helping to uh, design the plan through which the State Park System would manage California's natural resources, we do have a, a strong history in planning and looking regionally at ways of prioritizing conservation investments. Um, and we're doing the same today uh, in looking range-wide at uh, the natural range of the redwoods and uh, through both our science and research team um, and our partnering with organizations in the field, working to prioritize our investments and our shared investments with public and agencies and other nonprofits to make sure we're doing, uh, we're investing our resources in the right places, whether it be for recreational investments, whether it be for where can our restoration have the greatest impact and accelerate uh, the return of the old growth that we lost through a century of harvesting, um, and where the habitats are most in need of our attention so that we can use those plans and that GIS mapping to help focus our resources where we can have the greatest impact. The state park system in particular, and the Red redwood parks as well as a subset of them, um, are facing some real challenges. And in, in many ways, they're similar to the challenges that spawned their creation to begin with back in the early 1900s when, um, when many Americans were moving into cities. That same urbanization, that same sense of disconnectedness from the natural world is a fundamental challenge that, uh, that our society today is faced with again. Um, I think much has been said about uh, the disconnectedness of the youth of today and the focus on electronics and a real almost fear of the natural world. 
Uh, so the combination of, uh, of, an, of an urbanization and a disconnectedness of today's population, as well as a deterioration of the infrastructure of the parks themselves, many of them have the, have the same infrastructure that was put in 70 years ago, um, that, that is a disconnect that's our challenge to meet today, that uh, in order to make our parks, our natural resources more relevant and more sustaining for today's California, in order for parks to fulfill their democratic vision, their Olmstedian vision of uh, being the public commons, um, being the source of education, of health, and of spiritual inspiration that, uh, that you sense when you're at the foot of, a, of an ancient redwood. If we're going to return to that place and fulfill that vision, we have to upgrade our parks and we have to make them more relevant and more accessible to a California that looks very different today than when it did when we were founded in 1918. It was, all, it was an awesome first half. There was this one guy from the Redwoods. I think he did a great <laughs> job. No, uh, it, was a, it was really good. And from someone who spent his entire career in conservation, and particularly in, in conservation that focuses on parks for people, um, it was sustaining and inspiring. I think it is uh, a great reminder for all of us how Olmsted's vision uh, has been the catalyst for conservation uh, and conservation as, uh, as a purely American ideal. So not just from the environmental drivers that started to come around the 1960s after Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring. It, starting before the environmental movement of the 1960s, it was, it was about people. It was about making our communities healthier and stronger. It was about a better society that it can be built around a network of parks and green spaces and natural landscapes. And to be reminded that that started with Olmsted Sr. and as far back as the Civil War and carried through to his son's influence over the architecture of our shared public spaces nationally um, is remarkable and it's truing up of the philosophy that led me to this uh, career to begin with.